Today I want to speak to you about compassion. You know, compassion is such a beautiful thing to really love people, to really love one another. And to, and to come into action to show that love. But I found out that compassion is not a natural thing for many people. Uh, I was praying a couple of uh, months ago while I was going to another country and going to a church to minister there on Sunday morning. And when I was praying, I saw the pastor of that church standing before me with tears of his, in his eyes. And when I was praying, I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, why is this man crying? And the Lord spoke to me. He says, this man has tears of compassion. It was such a, when I later met this pastor, it was my first time in that church. It was such a beautiful man with such a soft heart for his people and for the nation he was serving and the people he was serving. And yeah, when you see tears of compassion or when you are crying yourself with tears of compassion, it's, it's there to move you to really do something about the needs of other people. The word compassion means to have a strong feeling of sympathy but also have a strong feeling of sadness for the suffering of others and also the willingness to help. So the word compassion, this is what the dictionary says, means to have a strong feeling of sympathy, but also have the willingness to really help other people. Both are important, the strong feelings and the willingness to, uh, to help. Now the word compassion exists out of two words. You have the word calm and you have the word passion. The word passion means a powerful feeling or an ambition that is materialized into action to put as much heart, kind and energy to the focus of the passion. In other words, passion is, a, is, a, is, a, is also a strong feeling and an ambition, but it got to be materialized into a focus where you put all your energy, put all your love, put all your kindness into the focus of your passion. For example, if you say that you love your wife, <laughs> that she is everything to me, you, you, you have passion for her, then you, you got to have strong feelings in your heart, of course. But there is also every kind of energy you have, you put into the focus of your passion, that is to love your wife. If you say, I have passion for God, you put all your energy, your heart, your strength, your mind, into the focus of your passion, into God. Now the word come means together, or to stand with, or to deal with. So you, you, you put that passion into come, into the other person. Another definition of passion is to suffer. We all know, or we call this the passion of the Christ. That was the suffering of Christ that ended up at the cross. And ended up him dying for all the world. We call that his passion, or the passion. And it has to do with suffering. The word come here, if you put come passion together, the come means to suffer with. So if we have compassion for people, it's also a, like you feel their pain, you feel their suffering, you suffer with them. And you have a willingness to help, really help them. Now, as we know Jesus, he was a man full of compassion. The whole Bible shows him as a man fully loaded with compassion, always working with that love to really help other people. Now the Bible says in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, that when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. The Amplified Translation says, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with pity. <laughs> he was moved with pity and sympathy for them. Now, this is very recognizable. When he saw the multitude, he was moved. And the Bible says he was moved with compassion. And every time I see this in the Bible, I want to be like Jesus. I want to become like Jesus. I want to be more like Jesus. I want to love people more like Jesus. I want to have that same compassion that Jesus has for other people. I want it to work in my own life. And that of my family and that of the church. And I believe compassion is the answer for the whole world. Love is the answer for everybody. And if we can show love, really put it into action, it will bring a change all over the world. Now my question is, how can we grow in compassion? When I study my Bible, first thing that comes to my mind is this word I call look. Just look. In Luke chapter 7, 
there was a boy, a, a boy died, and he was put into the coffin, and he was carried to the place of the funeral. And Jesus just moved by. And the Bible says, when he looked at the mother of the boy, he came into action and raised this boy from the dead. But the first word that touches me, it, it, the Bible says, when he looked at the mother, he looked. In John 11, here, here Jesus is. And Jesus um, um, heard the news about his friend was dying and his, his sisters Mary and Martha were there and they were all crying. And then suddenly the Bible says Jesus stopped and he wept when he looked at Mary. When he saw the need, when he saw the heart, when he saw the, the, the desperation and the sadness that was in Mary's heart, he started weeping. And all the time I found out in my own life and in this, by studying the words of God that compassion starts with looking. We first have to stop. You know, often we are so busy in our lives. We have to take care of the children. We have to do so many things. And we are so busy with our own life. We don't really see the other person. We don't really see the need or the cry. Sometimes I even hear mothers and fathers in their own family. They don't even see the cry of their own child just looking for love. And I found out we first have to stop and see. And look. And look in the eyes of the other person. When you start looking in the eyes, something will happen within you. The Bible says, the Bible tells a story about the compassionate Samaritan. You know, we see the priest and the Levite walking by. But we see the Samaritan who was a foreigner from another country, another Jew. When he, he first, the Bible says he stopped and looked at the man who was beaten by robbers. And when he looked at him, looked at him, he was moved with compassion. Step to this man, put him on his shoulders, put him on his donkey, and make sure he, he, uh, he was taken well care of. Everything starts with looking. Everything starts with stopping and just watch. After you looked, this is the first step of growing in compassion. Just stop. Sometimes you just need to stop and look. Secondly, you have to grow in, em in empathy, in empathic feelings. The Bible tells us that true religion unto the Father, unto God the Father, is really helping the widows and the orphans. Really do something, really have that empathy for other people stirring up on the inside of you. It's a very beautiful story. When I just got saved, I was so full of evangelism, so full of reaching out to other people. I, I served in church. Every day I was in church just to help the pastor and doing a lot of things. And I always was on time in church. Our church Sunday morning started at 10 o'clock. And I came to the train station, Leiden Central Station, here um, around 9.15. And I wanted to take the bus at that time to go to my church. But suddenly the Spirit of God urged in my heart just to stop and look. There was a homeless man lying in, in the beginning of the train station. And he was lying there. And then I felt the Spirit of God told me, stop. So just behind um, uh, a window, I, I start looking what's, what happened when people passed him by. Now, at that moment, a lot of church people I knew were, were getting by to go to the bus, to go to church, to worship God. And I start looking at them. How were they treating this homeless guy? Because you, can, you could not surpass him without noticing him. He was just laying there at the entrance. And, and at that time, I, I was just looking. I, I, I think I looked for a half an hour, just noticing how people react to that man who was just laying there. And uh, I think he just used drugs. He was out of there. And I found out nobody bought him bread. Nobody gave him something. Nobody was even moved. Nobody just prayed for him. Nobody did nothing. They just stepped him by because, like, he was an obstacle. And I, I didn't feel any love. I didn't feel any compassion people had for this young guy just laying there it could be anybody of us if we had different circumstances i don't know your situation i don't know where you're from but we can be that guy if you were born in another family or born in another country and as i saw all my brothers and sisters from the church just passing him by and i was just shocked to see that they were so hard in their heart and didn't want to do anything with that man 
And then a little later, I came into church and I saw the same people just worshiping God and tell them, tell them how much they love Him and tell them how good God is for them and tell them how, how much they appreciate the love of God. And I was shocked that Sunday morning because I didn't see that love being shown to this young man. You know, sometimes believers are the most hypocrite people there are. And it taught me a lesson. What use it is for us to worship the Almighty and we don't have compassion for the needy? Can you say amen? I found out if we really love God, that's what Jesus taught us. If we really love God, we will translate that love into love for people. I always say this, the more passion you have for God, the more compassion you have for people. Jesus was full of passion for the Father and he was full of compassion for all the people. You know, if you have compassion, you don't judge other people. If you, don't have, have, if you have, really have compassion in your heart, you won't gossip. You will not talk bad about other people because you will love them like Jesus loved them. True compassion must come forth out of a heart of empathy. You can understand the feelings. You can understand how it would be like if you would lay there. If you were sick yourself. If you were in bondage. If you have financial problems. You have empathy with the others. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, weep with the ones that weep and rejoice with the people that rejoice. But you know, that, that speaks about empathy, weeping with people that weep. Sometimes we've got to force and urge ourselves to move ourselves into the position of the other. Often we are so positional in our lives and we are are hardly capable to move ourselves into the position of that other person. How would you feel if you would be homeless? How would you feel if you were addicted? How would you feel if your son was addicted? How would you feel if your child was so mentally ill? How would you feel? Put yourself into their position. And don't judge love. <laughs> you know, we have to be become like Jesus. I read the scripture one day in John 13. That Jesus says, a new commandment I give unto you, that you should love one another like I have loved you. And when I first, when, for the first time when I read this scripture, I was thinking, what's new in this scripture? Jesus says, a new commandment I give unto you. But the old covenant already reminds me that I should love my neighbor. But then I saw something. We are called to love our neighbor as ourselves. But now Jesus says, I give you a new commandment, not to love your neighbor as yourself. Because to be frankly honest, sometimes I don't love myself as much or appreciate myself. But Jesus says, I give you a new commandment that you should love one another as I have loved you. And he brought into remembrance when I was praying, how does he love me? He loves me unconditional. He loves me passionate. <laughs> we sing this song, he loves me reckless. He loves me with self-sacrificing love. And I brought into remembrance the love that Jesus has for me. And now he commands me to put that love into action to other people. So I got to be, I got to love other people unconditionally. Mm. The word of God say, is saying to you that you should love one another. You should love your friends. You should love even your enemies with that unconditional love. That means that the love you have is not based on the conditions you have. That love you have is not based on what, uh, either or not that person loves you back. Either or not that person is good to you. The unconditional love, that means that there is no condition that determines the love you have for, for somebody else. It's a self-sacrificing love. It's an inseparable love. It's a constraining love. It pushes us. And that love of Christ is being manifest, has been made manifest by His death. To really show us and really convince everybody that his love is pure and just there to love people. And now Jesus say, abide in my love. There was one core anointing, one core source for every believer and for every church and every ministry. Every aspect of the ministry of a church and of a religious organization should be found in this origin, this deep, fiery, compassionate love of Christ. The Apostle Paul later on would say, 
the love of Christ urges me, constrains me. Even for all the preachers and pastors, your motivation every time, every Sunday, every Friday, every Wednesday, every Bible study, every, every service, every crusade, every conference you are in, you should always have this, this urge of love. And if you don't feel it, you first pray. You go to Christ and say, God, give me the love for the people I preach to. Every preacher got to be constrained and urged with the love of Christ. Every time, all the time. Because people will feel that love and their hearts will open for the words you will preach. Hallelujah. Hmm. One day, I was in Kinshasa, in Congo. And we were going to a... A, a conference, an important conference. Thousands of pastors would come there and we would preach and teach. And as I was dri driving with my, with my driver and some of my friends and co-ministers in ministry, I saw a little girl at the side of the road. And suddenly she drew my attention. There was also some people there. Uh, it was a very crowded neighborhood, but there were some people there making uh, fufu and making um, some food. And I told my driver, stop. And they told me, well, wait, wait, we have to be there on time and we cannot leave. It's uh, very busy on traffic now. I said, no, stop the car. And I, found, I, f I felt that they didn't like me to say stop. But I said, stop the car. And I pulled over and they pulled over and I got out of the car. And as soon as I got out of the car, this little girl, she was around three years old, started crying. Very hard and just running away from me, moving to their parents. Ah, Mundela, 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 ah, Mundela. Mundela means, in Lingala, it means white man or European man. And she was scared for me, scared of me, and probably scared of my color. So I, I went to the parents and, and I said, she don't have to be afraid, it's okay. And then her parents told me, that when she was born, she was born with what we call in Dutch a hase lip. It means that your lips are not uh, uh, well connected to one another and it's an open area just here at your lips. And that gave some problems and for the first one, two years in her life, she had to go to the hospital uh, and to put her lips straight. And she was helped by European, European white doctors. And because she was a little girl, she didn't know the whole thing. She just felt the pain of all the, the, the operations and surgery. So she connected white people with the pain she had when she was still very little. And she was afraid for white people. And the nicest thing is that these white people <laughs> were there to help her and to bless her. And the things she was afraid of would be a blessing to her. Now, when I heard that story and looked at the girl... Suddenly I was moved and the spirit of prophecy came over me. And the Lord said to me that later on she would come to Europe when she, was a bit, uh, when she would grow up to be a blessing to the white people. <laughs> and my heart was full of compassion. We gave her some money. We gave the family some things we still had in the car before we moved. And, I've, and I later went, uh, we, we drove further to our, our conference. And I was thinking how easy a, a deed of compassion is. But I found out that there's always some pressure around you for you not to step out. Just a little thing, just to bless somebody. There will always be voices, not now, why, uh, you are busy, uh, you should go to that person now, or you, you, you will be late for work. There's always a reason to miss the season. Oh, my God. There's always a reason to miss the season. <laughs> there's always a reason for you not to m move into compassion. But here, I'll tell you, you always have a better reason to do move <laughs> into compassion. And that's the love of Christ. When you feel that love, you just stop the car. When you feel the love, you just stop the plane. <laughs> when you feel that love, you just stop and look. And then you will feel the Spirit of God will, will move you. He will lead you into action to help or bless the other person. This I see the whole time in my Bible. You know, for many people, tears are a sign of weakness, especially men. But if you are a believer, let me speak to you. As a believer, tears are not a sign of weakness, but it's a sign of strength. It's a sign that your heart is still weak. As Christians, we should have a heart of a lamb and the skin of an elephant. 
<laughs> you should deal with criticism, whatever you do. But your heart got to be compassionate and loving and gentle and kind for everybody. And we should always focus on keeping this gentle heart. The Bible says, keep your heart above everything that is to be kept. You know, sometimes uh, I cry. I cry when I pray. I cry when I'm sometimes in counseling or in talking with people, just hearing their stories. Sometimes I even cry when I'm preaching. <laughs> but for me, it's not a sign of weakness. Even Jesus was crying. You know, when you feel the, the pain of somebody, it does something to you. Even when you feel your own pain. We got to understand that tears are there to bring healing. You know, even a, a, a wound in my skin will, 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 can heal. But a wound in my heart, I found out, is often healed by tears. And you can even heal the wound in somebody else's heart by your own tears. The tears of compassion. The Bible says that God keeps your tears in a bottle. You know, and I believe that God is transforming those tears into love. Because love is the most powerful force in the whole universe. Hmm. You know, many, many believers want to step out into the ministry of miracles, of signs, of healings and deliverance. But the force behind the miracles, the force behind the supernatural, is always the love of God. The love of God is the power, is the source of the anointing. The love of God is the force behind the power and the anointing. And compassion is needed to do miracles. Hallelujah. The Bible even we call the pastors in Ezekiel chapter 34 to really have tears and love for the sheep. If you found out in your own life you, you miss that love, you go back to your first love. You go back to Christ. You, and when you're in prayer, just give him space to speak to you, to manifest his presence to you. Because when you experience his love and become aware the word of God and the intention and the heart of God. If you come aware of the presence of God in your place and the love he has for you. It will give you all the strength and power you need to do ministry. May God bless you. God bless you.